and welcome to Lunchtime Politics right here on Nigeria's lead station, channels, television, broadcasting live from Lagos. I'm Jeffrey Uzanga. Coming up. The coast is getting clearer in Adamawa State as this SDP governorship candidate Umar Addo withdraws appeal before the Supreme Court against Governor Amado Fintiri. The Cold War continues in River State as the State House of Assembly insists Governor Siminilai Fubara must represent his budget to the lawmakers. And in a matter of weeks or days, rather, Imo State Governor will be sworn in for a second term as the state unveils its agenda for the people. Let's begin by telling you that the list of election-related litigations against Governor Maru Finteru has reduced as the 2023 governorship candidate of the SDP in Adamawa State, Umar Addo, has withdrawn his appeal against Governor Fintiri's re-election at the Supreme Court. Mr. Addo has sought the nullification of Fintiri's re-election on the grounds that there was substantial non-compliance with electoral act, corrupt practices, threats and violence during the exercise. Counsel for the SDP, Sylvester Madubi, says the party had 6,000 votes during the election and the court pointed out that there was a difference between the integrity of elections and numerical strengths. And according to the SDP Council, they saw the mood of the court and took the hint to withdraw the appeal. The Court of Appeal in Abuja had, in November 2023, dismissed a petition filed by Mr. Addo challenging Governor Fintory's victory in the 2023 polls. However, there seemed to be some drama as a candidate of that particular party, the SDP Omar Addo, moments ago says he is totally unaware of the withdrawal of that suit at the Supreme Court. This is the second time the Supreme Court is doing that you know, to me. The first time was in 2014. In the case that I took against President Bullock Jonathan for contesting for 2020 uh, 15 elections. Now, in the case of the five PDP governors, the Supreme Court, led by then Justice uh, Onoge, the former Chief Justice of Nigeria, made a judgment and said that no governor and president shall remain in office for a cumulative period exceeding eight years. For a cumulative period exceeding eight years. And that they said these eight years, like Justice Onoge put it, is like the rock of Gibraltar. It cannot be moved, not for a day. The same thing also happened today. Withdraw. Although the court, the court, to be fair, did not open its mouth, he said, oh, but that the court and the bar, they are one and the same thing. They said, bring the, uh, make the application. So I uh, made the application. Now, I spent a lot of money in this state. I spent a lot of money in the politics. I spent a lot of money in going to court from tribunal to the Supreme Court. But it seems that I, as Dr. Argo, I don't have court to go to. Not that I don't have a case. My case in the Supreme Court, which the force of withdrawal, you cannot beat it. There is a miscarriage of justice against me. There is a huge miscarriage of justice against me. The Supreme Court is telling me for the second time that I don't have a court to go to. Whatever it is, let the court determine the matter on the merits. Apparently, the last has not been heard in that particular case. We'll keep following through uh, on that particular matter in Adamawa State. But let's move on now to Taraba State, where Sadiq Tavida has emerged as the People's Democratic candidate in the February 3rd, 2024 by-election for Jalingo Zing Euro Federal Constituency in the state. Then aspirants were to participate in the primary election, but in an interesting twist of event, Nine of them stepped down following consensus between the aspirants and party leaders, leaving Mr. Tafida as a sole aspirant. The ballots were cast on Mr. Sadiq. Tafida scores 95 votes. I, Honorable Mohamed Ben Ali, the chairman of the electoral committee for Dalungo Yellow Zin Federal Constitution by election, I return to officer here by. Dear Honorable Sadiq Apostafira as 
Our party is happy to have somebody like me who, who is a very young person, very vibrant, and we are not afraid to, 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 to deliver. We are not going to be afraid to pound every nook and cranny of this constituency to deliver the benefits of democracy to our people. This consensus is a party tradition here because we have 10 aspirants. If you allow 10 aspirants to run for an election, there will be chaos here, there will be a lot of issues. Then our party sits down with these aspirants and asks them they willingly withdraw. If anybody did not withdraw, we would have uh, held this election with them here. It is a voluntary withdrawal, there is no compelling. Comp comp There's a lot to talk about in politics. Uh, well, we want to start with our very first conversation at the moment. And uh, but before that conversation, let's tell you that it is safe to say that there may not be an end in sight to the reverse political crisis following the complaints by the Speaker of the State Assembly, Mr. Martins Amir Wule, saying they are yet to make available, or the governor yet to make available, both the medium-term expenditure framework and the 2024 appropriation bill to the House. He conveyed his complaint during the first plenary of the Assembly in 2024, even as two bills killed first reading on the floor of the House. It's the first plenary of 2024 and the 90th legislative day at the makeshift River State House of Assembly in the premises of the Assembly Quarters, Port Harcourt. The atmosphere is convivial as members are in a jovial mood. Soon the speaker walks in and the business of the day begins. There are three items for consideration and among them are two bills and an expected report from the audit committee who plead for more time. Mr. Speaker, a bill for a law to amend the River State Traditional Rulers Law number 4 of 2015 and for other matters connected thereto. Mr. Speaker, this bill has three clauses, Mr. Speaker, when passed into law. A bill for a law to repeal the River State advertisements and use of state-owned properties, Provision Law Number 7 of 2022. Mr. Speaker, this bill has two clauses. Let me... Speaking, however, the Speaker complains that the State Governor has neither presented the medium-term expenditure framework nor the 2024 Appropriations Bill to the House. The 2024 Appropriation Bill is yet to get to this August Assembly. As it stands today, we have not received the medium-term expenditure framework. We have not received the Appropriation Bill for 2024. It means the state at the moment is operating without a budget for approved by this August Assembly in line with the 1999 Constitution as altered. Speaking to pressmen, however, the member representing Asari Toro, Honorable Enemy George, explains the idea behind both bills and denies that they are targeted at weakening the governor's power. The House is not taking away the power of the governor to do anything. We're only strengthening democratic institutions. If we've made laws to strengthen local government institutions, we're also making laws to strengthen traditional institutions so that traditional rulers can independently perform their functions without fear or intimidation. We need them to be more active in governance. We need them to be more active in the democratic space. The last has definitely not been heard in the reverse political imbroglio. Many will be waiting to see the governor's reaction to the latest move by the 26 legislators who are believed to be loyal to the FCT minister. Charles, Upper Room, Channels Television News. Well, as far as River State is concerned, as uh, that, uh, our reporter said, there's a lot to talk about. And uh, before we jump into that reverse conversation, I have other questions for my guest who is joining us via Zoom. 
the senior advocate of Nigeria, Mr. Lawrence Okojaja. Mr. Okojaja, thank you so much for coming on the program. Thank you for having me, and good afternoon, viewers. All right, Mr. Okojaja, I, I want to take the liberty of having you as a senior advocate on the program to deal with two issues as quickly as possible. First, um, there's been a lot of avalanche of fraud allegations in the Ministry of Humanitarian Affairs uh, concerning both the former and the current minister, as well as some people within the ministry. I just needed your quick take uh, on that particular issue, because some of this issue borders on laws and legislation and all of that, before we dive into the issue of River State. Thank you very much. Um, uh, the issue of corruption is one of the cardinal points of agenda of the president. And it's so disheartening that at this stage, so early in the life of the administration, we'll be having this kind of conversation about fraud, both for the past occupant of that office and the current occupant of the office now. So it's quite disheartening and uh, it's something that the president should put his feet down on and ensure that it is stamped out at least within the period of his mandate as president of the Federal Republic of Nigeria. But as you well know, she has been invited, the minister has been invited by the AFCC. So let's wait for the outcome of that investigation. And um, of course, you know that many companies have been uh, linked with. Uh, the quote and unquote the award of contract in respect of uh, that palliative and uh, so many big names or uh, one big name has been mentioned uh, who came on your program the other day to talk about it to say the fact that it's a different entity they have resigned from the company a long time ago so that is an issue that needs further interrogation and i'm happy that the efcc is handling the matter now. All right. Uh, just, uh, I, I guess what you are trying to say is what the Honorable Minister for Interior said uh, when he was citing that provision of the CAC in indemnifying himself. Because uh, clearly, when you incorporate a company, uh, it becomes body corporate with perpetual succession with common seal, meaning that the entity can clearly be different from the individual. Uh, if it's a limited liability company. But if we leave that issue for a moment, let's go to the issue of River State. Um, I, I, and I know you're close to these issues because of uh, the, the state you're from. Uh, the governor is expected to, to present the budget again. But let's not forget that this governor has presented the budget to a house of four and has even signed the budget into law. Do you expect him to still do the same the second time, according to the lawmakers? Well, I don't know who brief for the governor, and I don't know who brief for what I know what the legislature was. But I do know that it is for the governor to represent the deal that has been passed. You must recall that this is a law that's So that takes them. All right, well, Miss, Mr. Okojaja, uh, we could barely hear some of the things you, you said, uh, but just a quick one before I let you go. Um, we saw the resolution uh, brokered by the president, eight of them, and uh, some have been fulfilled, others have not been fulfilled. But the questions I ask other senior advocates of Nigeria, can we use a political resolution to correct a constitutional issue? My answer will be no. So, and in any case, this from uh, my, my sincere apologies, uh, senior advocates, uh, sincere apologies, uh, but uh, that's how far we may be able to take this because of the quality of audio. We don't know, uh, of course, network connection. 
But I've been speaking with Lawrence Okojaja, senior advocate of Nigeria, as he weighed in on the issue of corruption allegations in the Ministry of uh, Humanitarian Affairs, as well as the political imbroglio in River State. SAN, thank you so much for coming on the program. Let's now switch gears to other issues on the program. In a matter of days, the governor of Imo State, Hope Uzadima, will be sworn in for another four-year term in office. The swearing-in follows his declaration as winner by INEC in November or on November 11 governorship election. That was one of the off-season elections that took place in that month. So what's there for the citizens of the state in the next four years as he holds onto the saddle of leadership? I'm being joined on lunch and politics by the chief technical advisor to the Imo State Governor on new Imo project, Mr. Jerry Chukweke. Mr. Jerry, good to see you again right here. <laughs> Thank you and Happy New Year. Uh, Happy New Year, yeah. The last time we saw was in 2023. Uh, exactly so. <laughs> in, in about five days, uh, yes. Governor Hobo Zodima will be sworn in. Um, and so, natural question, how are preparations yes. for that? Well, uh, good question. Um, all roads lead to Imo come the 15th, which is just next Monday. Um, the people's governor and the government of Imo State is inviting quality, high quality Nigerians from across the country and the diaspora, business community, traditional rulers, Southwest, the North, North Central, all of that. And assembling Imolites. And when I say Imolites, yes, the people's governor is the governor of the APC, but he's a governor of Imo state. So members of opposition parties are also invited. Uh, let me tell you what's going on. Our people are interested in showing the world that Imo is not only being transformed, but open for business. And we're asking them to come, experience what we know has happened in Imo the last four years. So they become reference points, become important word, reference points for Imo and positive word of mouth. Let them experience what good governance has done and where we're going for the future. But having said that, our governor is grateful to Imo people. They returned home. I'm talking about in droves. They poured home from across the country, from the diaspora. Business was good. Security was high and strong in terms of peace and quiet. Our people had fun. Imo was a good place to be in. And I hear many parts of the Southeast as well, generally speaking. Imo in particular was a celebration time. And the experience, that's what they wanted to see and, and feel what has happened in Imo and what's happening. So it's actually, it was not only a celebration, it was a, a validation of the work our governor has done. Okay. So we're very excited about it. And now, guess what? We are moving into now another celebration. The celebration of the inauguration, which is the Imo people's celebration of the achievements of this governor, the people's governor, in addition to the fact that their sweet dreams of expectations of the more work he says he would do, and he will do them. Okay, let, let's, we'll let's because I want to squeeze in as many questions as yes, possible. Yes, that's fine. Uh, within the short time we have. So this is four years down, yes. four years about, another four years to start. What is the governor bringing to the table that will be different from what he's done so far? Okay, well, the governor will speak to that in his inaugural. He will speak to that. But we have strong indications from what he has been saying. What is even important at this stage is the expectations of Imo people. Imo people want jobs. Mm. Imo people want businesses to thrive. And how do we get that done? Work in partnership with the private sector for energy, power supply. Imo people want improved security. Imo people want him to move further on education, strengthening education, building more infrastructure, rural, connecting the great infrastructure that has happened in the urban areas. In addition to that, Imo people want enhanced health care. He's working on them. And not only that, the excitement 
of the Orashi project, which is the dredging of Uguta Lake, Orashi River, and about 98 nautical miles Atlantic, Atlantic Ocean, where our governor is focused on ensuring that we achieve this medium, middle level port situation, where middle and small ves vessels will come into Imo and all the knock on effects. That, that, that's been, so, that, so a lot is happening, okay. Imo people can't wait. Uh, that's why I said I want to squeeze in as many questions as possible. Yes. How much of the private sector is involved in this? Because at the end of the day, no matter how fantastic these ideas are, we always know and we believe, and everybody seems to agree that yes. government is bad, uh, is, is terrible at managing businesses. So yeah. that's why the private sector must be given that uh, environment, what Correct. they call um, a conducive environment. Correct. How much of a conducive environment is the governor bringing to the table? Uh, is he engaging the private sector? What assurances is he giving to them, yes. given the challenges of insecurity that has been in the past four years in the state? Well, uh, please bear in mind that the people's governor was a private sector player before he became very active in politics. So he understands the import of working with the private sector. That's his focus. We know government can create jobs. Government can't run businesses. So is he engaging them? He specifics. Not only is he engaging, one of the beauties that we experienced in the last few weeks is the diaspora Imolites who are interested in investing in Imo. In fact, they are asking for a diaspora office where coordination and guidance about local investment and ease of doing business can be handled. Our governor is actively engaging. Let me tell you, one of the key things is this issue of energy. Look at what's happening with the Orashi free trade zone. Our governor is directing that whole process, engaging with the private sector. It's working. People like Walter Smith are already on the second phase of their refinery. CEPLAT. Mm -hmm is now budgeted monies to come build a refinery in Imo. We are looking for Imo gas, which is the largest reserve in West Africa, to help power Imo. But these will be embedded power so that our people can have the energy to operate and I, run our I'm business. Happy you talk, He's I'm, very, I'm very, happy very you talked about uh, the private sector being involved because yes. when you look at data, I always refer to data. Yes. Data is what we can speak to. Yes. But the MBS 2022 data, Imo was top at number one highest unemployment level. And I want to say exactly, read to you exactly what the governor said since you are talking about him providing environment and creating jobs for people. Correct. So I want to know how far this has gone. The governor, before the election, said... Let me tell you something. I have gone further to negotiate with European Union companies and Canadian companies. They are sending special areas of digital skill, which our youth will also learn. And by December this year, which was 2023, 4,000 emo youth will be employed in Europe. Once their employment letters come, the governor will pay for your tickets. December has gone, has passed. Are there 4,000 people outbound? Well, you raised this question with me the last time I was here. And I gave you the answer. Let me tell you what the governor was referring to. He was talking about the graduation of, the, of cohort two, 15,000 emo youth that have been brought into the global workforce. Mm. And he was saying that our people who are running the scale up, emo scale up program, were engaging with international organizations to engage these young, vibrant, able, willing, now certified Imolites in information technology and computer literacy in both work outside of Imo and inside of Imo. What is important is that these jobs are not only now being created, some of our young people have traveled abroad, many have gained many employment. I will come to that. Just hold a minute. No, no, no. Because we, got, the, we, don't, we don't have the luxury of time. Yeah, now, but, now, the reason, the yes. reason I'm holding off is because yes. on January the 15th, yes. Governor Hopu Zodima is going to mount the rostrum or yes. the podium and he's going to make yet another set of promises. So I'm challenging you to yes. the promises he's made. 4,000 people are going to be heading to Europe because he said, when your employment comes, we will pay for your ticket. So ne not necessarily mobile jobs. So I'm just asking, how many people have gone so far? Is it 10? Is it 20? Is it 30? I He's can... going to make more promises. No, no, no. It's not about promises. Our Imo people, 
the young people who were part of cohort two okay. and cohort one. Many of them have traveled and many are already gainfully employed as graphic, gra graphic designers, website designers. They are working as part of the global workforce and earning dollars. In fact, is one of the issues that came up in all of the things our diaspora Imolites are talking about because they are interested in ensuring that they can play their part in how we grow the Imo economy. Because you can't attract foreign direct investment easily without the confidence of local investors and also what your own people in the diaspora are okay. doing a, with a the Before I let you go, yes. uh, Mr. Chukweke, security is a big issue. Yes. What is it doing in terms of the IMO security network to improve the security of the state? What? You can answer that in just 30 seconds. Yes, I will. It's working it. already. That's why we had great peace and quiet in IMO state right through the holidays. I, I am only aware of two incidents of kidnapping attempts. IMO was peace and quiet all the way. And our people are seeing the effects of all the adjustments. And we thank the security agencies as well. Because with the investment our governor is making in this regard, and IMO people buying into peace and quiet. Right. And that's the key. We are asking IMO people, and that's his desire. Because look at the budget proposal. Nearly 600 billion naira for 2024. Over 83% in capital budget. All right. So he's All focusing right. on how more dividends of democracy will come so, to our people. No, 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 absolutely. So, uh, of course, we're going to be looking out for what he'll be saying on January the 15th. I must yes. thank you, the Chief Technical Advisor to the Imo State Governor on new Imo projects, Mr. Uh, Jerry Chukweke, well, thank, we, you. thank we you. We thank you. We invite Nigerians thank to you. come and experience Imo I'm, I'm, sure, I'm sure we're going to watch it live. Imo is open for business. No, not a problem. Thank you thank for you. coming on the program. Thank we must you. thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, we move on to other issues. Uh, well, the federal government has inaugurated an eight-member interministerial committee to probe degree certificate of racketeering by both foreign and local private universities. The Minister of Education, Professor Taha Maman, who inaugurated the committee in Abuja, taxed the committee to do their job diligently without fear of anyone. The committee, headed by Professor Jibrila Amin, Chairman Board of Trustees, Committee of Vice Chancellors, has the Executive Secretary of the National Universities Commission, Dr. Chris Mayaki, as the Secretary. Other members of the committee are Ambassadors uh, Lazarus Bakasa from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Ebel Olarewaju, Office of the National Security Advisor, Owen Nkoku, Office of the National Security Advisor, Amina Luga, Federal Minister of Youth Development, Mrs. Doom Yotem from Joint Admissions and Matriculations Board, and a representative of the federal government from the Ministry of Justice. The committee is, so among other things, examine the veracity of the allegations of de degree certificate racketeering within both foreign and local private universities in Nigeria. And that's it uh, on the program. Thank you so much for your time. And of course, your usual company, um, Jeffrey Uzama. You've been served on lunchtime.